This is Terry Hancock. I'm an amateur astronomer and astrophotographer and I live and shoot my images from my backyard observatory in Fremont, Michigan. For the next few minutes I'm going to take you on a journey through my world of astrophotography. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about me, what inspired me, choices of equipment, the software I recommend and I use, and finally some of my latest images and the techniques I use to capture. My interest in astronomy goes right back to when I was a child, born in the north of England and spent most of my adult life in Australia. I would love to travel to the outback regions where the light pollution is minimal as you can see on this NASA view of the Earth at night. I was first inspired by the brilliant astronomer and author Sir Patrick Moore and his famous TV show the sky at night and as a child my parents brought me many of his books on the subject. My first telescope was a crude four and a half inch Newtonian reflector telescope. It seems that this was a very popular choice as many of my peers started with exactly the same telescope. It had an equatorial mount without the electronics we see today and movement was done by hand. But you know what, I think I had more fun with this scope than any other and enjoyed my first glimpses of the moon, the rings of Saturn and Jupiter and its four brightest moons. This is my tiny backyard 8 foot by 8 foot or 2.4 by 2.4 metre observatory known as the Down Under Observatory where today houses my equipment for astroimaging. Prior to having the permanent mount for my telescope I used a portable setup like what you see in the foreground of this picture. And I would wheel the telescope in and out of my house each clear night. I made many mistakes selecting and buying equipment and my very first dedicated imaging rig was a 10 inch Schmidt Cassegrain type telescope on a fork mount. And I soon found this was totally unsuitable for imaging. You might say I learnt the hard way. So let's look at some of the things I learnt in the process your imaging optics, the telescope, which is basically a big telephoto lens, should be in the range of 65 millimeters to 90 millimeters, which has a short to moderate focal length, which is essential to learn how to guide the scope comfortably for exposures of around three minutes or longer, a small refractor we call the guide scope, and a small CCD camera for guiding is also used. The imaging mount the German equatorial type that you can see in this foreground of this next picture should be rated to carry between 30 to 40 pounds for, a, for an 80 millimeter refractor say and there are quite a few brands in this range that carry a price tag of between 1100 to 1500 dollars US please do not make the mistake of buying too big a telescope for your mount the less weight on your mount, the easier it will track and guide your target and the better your end result will be. When buying any astronomy or astrophotography equipment, make sure you buy from a recognised dedicated dealer and not a department store. I've also bought a lot of equipment used online from places like Astromart and Cloudy Nights Classifies. It's a great source. Let's move on to camera selection and with the advent of the digital age we have choices of either a DSLR camera or a CCD. As a beginner I chose a Canon DSLR over its competitors due to the better aftermarket support and hardware selection. I chose to have my cameras modified. Let me explain this. All DSLRs have sensors that are naturally sensitive to infrared light because the manufacturers install IR filters to keep most IR energy from reaching the imaging chip to maintain a correct color balance similar to what we see with our eyes. Unfortunately these, these filters also reduce the hydrogen alpha light which is very important for capturing the red nebulosity seen in most astro images. By removing this stock IR filter and replacing with either clear glass or another IR filter that is transparent to hydrogen alpha, the camera's sensitivity for astrophotography is greatly increased. 
This modification is not something that many of us, certainly me, are capable of doing. There are many specialists that do modifications and I choose to, chose to use my good friend Brent Oliver of Hypercams and Mods down in Florida for all of my DSLR modifications. For Deep Sky, which is what I do, the, bit, the DSLR is best to be controlled by software through a PC and with the latest models only require just one connection, the USB and hooking up to a computer allows you to achieve best focus and also control for exposures. It also allows for best organisation of files. Even today I consider some of my best astro photos were shot using a DSLR. The main drawback with the DSLR, in my opinion, is the necessity of dark frames that need to be taken to rid the final image of noise caused by, mainly by the lack of cooling. Cool DSLRs are commercially available as an aftermarket modification, but these are very expensive and not worth messing with, in my opinion. The other option is the CCD camera, which is what I use today. There are many commercial choices and my camera is made by QHY and the model is the QHY9. Quite a modestly priced camera with a similar medium sized chip to most DSLRs. Cooled CCD cameras can be either one shot colour which is basically like a DSLR with the addition of cooling but my choice was the monochrome CCD which allows me to use not only the typical red, green and blue filters that make up the colour matrix but also the all important luminance which is a clear filter and this is used to capture the images in black and white and is added to the mix of colour exposures during post processing to add contrast and sharpness to the final image. And then also narrowband filters, hydrogen alpha, oxygen 3 and sulfur 2, to compose narrowband images. Now if you live in a place where the light pollution is really bad, and consider this as many images do, because their narrowband filters block some of the light pollution. All these filters are mounted in a motorised colour filter wheel and are operated through the PC. In this setup you see here, which has actually changed a bit since I took this image, you will see what we call an off-axis guider, which has a pick-off prism that captures the light through the main optical tube assembly. This is by far the best selection in my opinion for guiding. The main drawbacks are the high cost and sometimes it becomes difficult finding a bright star. Hence I ended up using a much more sensitive and expensive CCD for my current setup. I also use a QHY9 one-shot colour camera occasionally and just recently it helped me a lot when imaging M31. I was quite impressed with the results. What I really like about the QHY cameras is that they are very modest, modestly priced, they are lightweight in construction and the cooling capacity is amazing. With an advertised ambient of minus 50 Celsius, I'm able to cool these cameras and shoot at 30, minus 30 C all year round. Here is a picture of my imaging rig. rig. It's changed since the picture was taken and currently I'm using a 12 inch Ritchie Crichton and a 92mm TMB APO refractor which has been used for most of my latest images. Pictured here in the picture are, are uh, a 10 inch Ritchie Crichton and a 5 inch TMB refractor and a small refractor that I was using for guiding before I went to off axis guiding. The huge concrete base that supports the mount and telescopes was a mistake by my, by my construction guy and it's 24 inches in diameter um, is just way too big. Uh, it was supposed to be 18 inch diameter which would be more than adequate for any scope up to this um, type of capacity. The telescope mount, a Paramount GT1100S, the predecessor to the Paramount ME is controlled using the Sky 6 planetarium software. 
the focusing by feather touch on one scope and moonlight on the on the Ritchie Crichton is also controlled through the PC. I spend little time out there except to open and close the roof. The control of the mount and cameras is done remotely from my desktop PC inside my house. And here is what I see from my desktop. I'm using the Sky 6 by Software Bisc to control the mount and I have to use this as, an in, as it is an integral part of the Paramount's robotics. However, for other type of mounts there is other software out there that will control. Stellarium for example is freeware and has an excellent interface in my opinion. To capture images I'm using Maxim DL and I'm also using Maxim DL for guiding as you can see in the top left hand corner the little guide box. Over on the right you see a guiding graph which shows me just how good or bad my guiding is. Processing and post-processing is too big an area for me to discuss here but let me just say it has taken me all of the past five years to get to the level I am today and I'm still learning. For post-processing again there are many options. The most popular are either Photoshop, any of the CS versions will work whether it's CS2, CS3, CS4, 5 and the new 6 versions or PixInsight. Well I chose Photoshop, good or bad. and. Uh, we spend a lot of money on equipment so if we don't have the correct tools to process then this precious investment goes to waste. I found the best tutorials for me were by Warren Keller. It can be found at ip4ap.com and some of his video tutorials are free. For more advanced techniques I chose to use Tony Hallis's Easy CCD video tutorials which are really excellent. They cover many of the basics but Tony gets right into advanced techniques especially for narrowband imaging. I also offer astrophotography and processing basics tuition. I do one on one doing remote desktop with TeamViewer and it's done at, at very low cost. Okay now we're going to move on to some of my images. Here we see M27, the Dumbbell Nebula in narrowband um, where the RGB was replaced using channel swap. Here's M27 again uh, using the California, France, Hawaii telescope palette. Here's M27 again. and this time I was using the Hubble palette. This one here was using the red, green and blue plus hydrogen alpha filters and assigning the hydrogen alpha as red. And here's just a view of M27 using the red, green and blue natural filters. And to date this is the only um, image that I have shot using the 12 inch Ritchie Crichton and it's a um, uh, an image of the Crescent Nebula and uh, here we have the crescent with um, RGB and hydrogen alpha. Um, I assigned uh, the hydrogen alpha to the red channel. And here we have a, um, a narrowband version. This is a bicolor version. And uh, I used only the colors or um, well, the filters hydrogen alpha and oxygen 3. Here's a, another view 
of uh, NG7688 Hubble pallet with um, the S2 assigned to the red channel the hydrogen alpha assigned to the green and the oxygen 3 to the blue here we have another view a different view again using the CFHT palette of the crescent nebula and this one is sort of like a color hybrid where I used all of the narrowband filters in and uh, and RGB combined one of my favorites M13 the great globular cluster in Hercules this one was a uh, a combination using uh, a DSLR and uh, the QHY9 CCD I guess my most photographed uh, image is M31 Andromeda here we see uh, just a, um, a luminance red green blue plus hydrogen alpha view Now we have the Lagoon and the Trifid Nebula and this one is shot in uh, luminance, red, green, blue and hydrogen alpha which is added to the red channel. Here we have the Sol Nebula, IC1848, and again this is in Hubble Palette with S S2 filter assigned to red, hydrogen alpha filter assigned to green, and O3 filter assigned to the, assigned to the blue channel. Here we have the Elephant's Trunk Nebula, IC1396, again in Hubble Palette. and the Rosette Nebula in narrowband and wideband combined. This was uh, using red, green, blue and all the narrowband filters. Here we have M33, the Triangulum, Triangulum Galaxy. This one again in LRGB uh, and Hydrogen Alpha. Managed to pick out some really fine detail there. want to thank you all for joining me today. I've hope, I hope you've enjoyed this journey through the cosmos.